night. Uh, Pastor Steve was going to be here tonight. He actually just texted me while um, we were praying there that he wishes he was here. He is doing well. He is recovering well, but still not able to, to be with us and to preach tonight. Um, so you're stuck with me again tonight. And again, we have only seven weeks in our study of Moses, so we cannot possibly cover all that happens in the life of Moses, all that the Bible accounts for us in his life. So what we're going to try to do tonight, what I'm going to attempt to do, is look at the, the summary view of what happens after the Red Sea. We know that a lot happens in the life of Israel, in the life of Moses, after the Red Sea, and we're going to try to take an aerial view and, and see what we can learn from the mistakes, the many sins that Israel and, and even Moses committed after God did such a powerful work at the Red Sea and through the plagues that we've looked at the past few weeks. So to do that, I actually want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the New Testament, not to the Old Testament. We're going to use 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 14 as our guide through this passage of time from the Red Sea all the way into uh, when God actually faithfully delivers Israel into the promised land. But to begin to get our minds thinking about that, I, I want to think about something that I've been seeing a lot, and actually every morning for about the past week as I drive to the church. You might have seen it, the, the same warning signs that I have been seeing on my route to church if you come to the church through Gypsy Hill and Long Rifle Road. These two roads, where they meet, is, is kind of a notorious intersection because you have to go through a, a really pretty horrible one-lane bridge where these two roads merge together. And for about the past week, there's been these warning signs up, warning me and my fellow motorists that beginning in April, that stretch of road is going to be closed. It's going to be impassable until the end of June. And of course, this there are countless other warning signs along the road and in our lives that we pass every single day. But the thing about warning signs is warning signs are only good if we follow them, right? Warning signs are only good if we read them, but then actually put whatever their warning is into action. Warning signs aren't worth the aluminum or the paper that they are printed on if they do not lead us to changed actions. And I remind ourselves of this because the events of Moses, the life of Moses, and the exodus of Israelites that we've studied the past few weeks, they should serve to us as giant warning signs. They should serve to the Christians, to the people of God that have come after them as huge warning signs not to follow and fall to the same mistakes and, and sins that we know they are about to commit post the Red Sea crossing. Because we know what happened to Moses and Israel thus far in our study, and, and also we know, as, as Paul reminds us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, what is going to happen to Moses and the Israelites. What happened is God has done some incredible Work. He has done some amazing and, and powerful things through Moses and before the people of the Israelites. He's turned a guy in Moses from a guy who seemingly was going to be sentenced to a life in his own personal prison, wandering in the desert in his own sin, into a guy who was set free not only from his own prison, but a guy that God used to set God's people free from their own prison, the prison of slavery that they were in in Egypt. And God does all that through his mighty and powerful acts. And these acts were not done in a closet. They were not done hid away in some corner, but they were done for all people to see and experience and, and change their lives because of. And we've studied them the past three weeks. These are the, the ten grand plagues that Pastor Jared led us through, and then God's final deliverance of his people through the Red Sea parting that we looked at last week. These were a mesmerizingly amazing and powerful shows of God's awesome power. And where we left off last week in Exodus chapter 14, verse 31, was with this. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord the, the displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they put their trust in the Lord and in Moses. That's where we left off. And uh, the apostle Paul speaks about this reverent fear of the Lord and, and trust in the Lord that Moses and the Israelites were, were baptized in or united in, in verse number 1 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. But Paul also here in this chapter speaks of what we know is to come from this moment for Moses and the Israelites. Because unfortunately, and, and I hope this isn't a spoiler alert to you, but Israel does not do this, right? Right? Israel, from the Red Sea parting forward, they do not do a very good job of putting their trust and hope in the Lord as they declare. In fact, Israel does a horrible job of both fearing and trusting in 
the Lord. We, of course, have just a seven-week series. And we cannot study all that God does through or after the Red Sea crossing and their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. But what happens is God continues to be so good and so faithful to Israel in providing for their needs. He continues to provide for their needs from their most basic to their greatest needs. This comes uh, first, the most basic needs in in just food and water in chapter 16 of the book of Exodus when God provides for his people manna and quail. We know that God provides for uh, water for his people at least twice through just their striking of a rock. Then God, through this magnificent, another magnificent display of his power and glory, he gives Moses and Israel those Ten Commandments and law. Again, not because he's a, an overbearing overlord, but because he wants what is best for his people. And he knows that his people are coming out of 400 years of living in slavery. So he takes the time, he makes the effort to lay out very clearly what is best for his people, how they can worship and follow him rightly. God gives them guidelines for how they can have God's very presence dwelling among them and going before them and coming behind them as they, we seen last week. Throughout Moses' life, God does truly amazing things for Moses and for his people. But yet even with the immense amount of good that God does for his people, Exodus chapter 32 is, is still there. Exodus chapter 32 still comes, right? Even with all the good that God does for his people, Exodus chapter 32, if you're not familiar, the sin, the rebellion, the rejection of God by his people still comes. I would invite you to, in your own devotional, personal time, read Exodus chapter 32 through 34 this week to really reflect on the sheer audacity and the sin of man and yet the grace of God in the face of the sin of man. But for our purposes, what happens in Exodus chapter 32? Moses, in this moment, he goes up the mountain. He's convening. He's conversing with God. He's receiving the tablets that hold the Ten Commandments on them. God here is being good. God is, being, God is providing. God is being faithful to his people once again. On the converse, down at the base of the mountain, what is man doing? What is humankind doing, though? The same man that was just saved by this mighty God. Now they are all of a sudden growing tired of God. Now, very quickly, their fear and their trust in the Lord has already waned. And because the people saw that Moses was taking a long time coming down the mountain, they've already lost their hope, their trust in God and and Moses as God's servant. In other words, because God didn't function in the timing and in the way that the people had determined to be best, they come, they come to Aaron, Moses' brother, and they say, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. If you look at those verses, if you look at Exodus chapter 32 in your NIV Bible, it comes with the heading, the golden calf. But if we really think about what is happening here, how good and faithful God has been to these people, how clearly he's shown them his good and faithfulness, and yet how blatantly and how dumbly these these Israelites are rejecting that good and faithfulness from God, we could really title this heading more correctly, these guys are idiots, right? I mean, they are so blind to their own sin to reject this God and, and think that he somehow lost them or forgot them. God has just done amazing and mesmerizing things that this world has ever seen before these people to see. It's one of the most talked about and amazing events that the world has ever known. It is, the, it is so clear that the fleeing Egyptians and the Israelites themselves at the Red Sea crossing say that, that God is, in fact, the one true and living God. But yet here we are, just 18 chapters over in very little time chronologically after that moment, These people go from fearing, they go from trusting in the Lord and Moses as the Lord's servants to saying, I don't know, man. I don't know, Aaron. I don't know what happened to your brother Moses. I don't know what happened to him, but one thing I do know is it looks like we need some some gods to go before us, right? It looks like we need some substitute gods. And so the people, they craft in their mind this idea to, to take the gold that the one true and living God has collected for them as we looked at last week, as we reminded ourselves last week, the one true and, and living God he takes and he's the one that provides all the gold that, that Israel is now using to, to craft into a lowercase g God before them into the golden, the golden calf. Have you ever thought about that? The audacity of man. 
That stood out to me this week as I studied for this message. Remember again what we talked about last week. God not only paved the way for Moses and Israel to leave Egypt, but he paved the way for Moses and Egypt to not leave Moses and Israel not to leave Egypt empty-handed. They took with them the Egyptians' plunder. They took with them the Egyptians' stuff. And if we think about it, Israel, as people living in slavery for 430 years, they probably didn't have a lot of gold that was truly their own. They probably didn't have a whole lot of gold that was their own before they took the Egyptians' plunder. And so yet here they are collecting all that God has just given to them, and they're casting it into their own image. They're making it into their own idol. They're forming it in the way that they want it to be formed in. They're using it in the way that they want to use it. I mean, these guys and gals, they are, they are not the brightest. They have been given, they have witnessed one of the most wonderful, amazing moments in the history of God. And we would all say, and yet they turn around and they say, I don't know what happened to this God. I don't know what happened to his servant, but, but let's make this stuff that this God and, and this servant has given to us and make another God that will hopefully go before us. Something that will, that will meet our needs in our timing. Let's make a God that will be in our image and be under our control, right? That, brothers and sisters, is, is what the Bible calls an idol. These people are, are given witness to so much of God's goodness. They're given witness to so much of God's power. And yet they turn to such lesser things. They reject this great God at their first inconvenience. At the first opportunity that God does not function in the timing in the way that they want him to function in. And of course, we would all agree, I believe, that that's a sad, that's a sinful, that's a pathetic response to this good God. But the thing that the reality that the Apostle Paul reminds us of here is that this sad this sinful, this pathetic story is, is so often our story as well. Because we have been given, Paul reminds us here, we have been given the same and even greater privileges by God than the Israelites. We have the privilege that the Israelites had of knowing the strong hand of the Lord through the Red Sea parting, through the plagues. But we also know on top of that what is to come, what God is going to do. We know the, 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 that the strong hand of the Lord through Israel's sin, through their unfaithfulness to him, is eventually going to live up to his promises. He's eventually going to land the Israelites in the promised land. We know that throughout more of Israel's sin, throughout more of their rebellion and rejection of God, he's going to set up the most righteous earthly king that the world has ever known in David. He's going to give Israel a time of unprecedented prosperity and peace, only for Israel and that righteous king to, to foul it all up, right? Only to lead to a time of gradual descent into sin by God's people. And of course, we know the greatest work of God's hand, that in the midst of the nation of Israel falling to that lowest point, to finding themselves again living under an oppressive government, this time Rome, we know that God once again and through that time, he's going to reveal his power for all people to see through his own son being born into our flesh, being born of woman, being conceived by the Holy Spirit only to be crucified under Pontius Pilate. Born into our flesh to die into our flesh. But amidst that son's death, God is going to fully, completely, and most wonderfully reveal his power in a much more visible, much more magnificent way through raising that son back to life again. We have the same and we have even greater privileges to God's power than the Israelites. And it is these facts and events that condemns us further and makes our sin and rebellion against God all the more egregious. Because again, we have not only witnessed the Red Sea crossing, but we've experienced Jesus Christ's resurrection from the grave. The same was true of the Corinthian church that Paul originally wrote this letter that we have as the, first, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. We've experienced this power of God that can and does raise people back to life again. The power that, that, is, that is surpassed by no other. Yet so often we turn to such lesser things. So quickly we often turn to such lesser things, things made by our own hand and things made in our own image. 
That is what an idol is and, and the temptation to put those idols before our great, glorious, and all-powerful God is what Paul addresses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1, when he says this, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, the fact that our ancestors were all under the same cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. This can be a confusing passage because Paul is talking about a cloud, then he's talking about a sea, then he starts talking about being baptized into Moses, being baptized into that cloud and the sea. What in the world is Paul saying to us? What does Paul uh, mean here? What is Paul trying to illustrate Again, what Paul is illustrating here, what he means is, is, again, we have the same privileges as the people of Israel. We have greater privileges than the people of Israel. The cloud that, that God speaks of is the cloud that we talked about last week that would go before the Israelites to pave their path, to light their path by night, to, to guide their path by day. It's the same cloud that would go behind the Israelites and make sure that they were protected from the uh, schemes of the evil and the enemies. It, the cloud illustrates God's guidance and God's protection. And we, of course, have been given that same cloud. We have the same guidance. We have the same protection that the Israelites have been given. We actually have a, a greater sense of guidance and protection than the Israelites were given. For we don't have a cloud that goes before us, comes behind us, or walks alongside of us. We have the very Spirit of God. Not alongside of us, not before us, not behind us, but dwelling actually within each and every one of us. Dwelling within each and every follower of Jesus. Of, yeah, follower of Jesus. We have God's guidance. We have God's protection. We also have God's deliverance. That's what's signified in the water. The waters of the Red Sea's parting, they are real historical events. It's something that actually happened. But this event also is a symbol for an even greater deliverance by God. A deliverance not from a temporary slavery, even a temporary slavery as long-lasting as a slavery of 433 years. God's greatest delivery of slavery, of course, is the death of his son as the ransom for our sins, no matter how great or how many those sins might be. God has freely and fully given his people the privilege of this deliverance, of his deliverance. That's what's symbolized in the water that Paul speaks of. But what is symbolized in the food that Paul speaks about? We've already mentioned it tonight. Both leading up to and, and after Israel's sin in Exodus 32, God provides for his people physical food. He provides for his people their most basic need through quail and manna. But of course, even greater and deeper than that, the real food that God provided for the Israelites and that he still provides for us is, is the bread of life. It is, it is our true spiritual nourishment. It is God's word and greatest of all, his word made flesh that is his son, Jesus Christ. One of the themes that runs through this story, this study of Moses, is God provides. God provides all that we need. God is the sustenance, and He has God is the sustenance that we need and desire. He was that for the Israelites, and, and He is that for us. Yet we, so much like the Israelites, too often like the Israelites, forego the sustenance of God and instead pursue the sustenance, the insufficient sustenance of man. But Paul reminds us in verses 5 through 10 that, that again, we are the same people with the same privileges, but he calls us to seek different results. Read with me verses 5 through 10. Paul says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with them. In other words, regardless of this, even with this, God was not pleased with most of them, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as an example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. He says to us, do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to an, an indulge in revelry. We should not commit a, in sexual immorality as some of them did. And then in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And he says to us, do not grumble as some of them did. And some of them were then killed by the destroying angel. 
What God is saying to us here through the Apostle Paul is this. Steer clear of the downward spiral that is sin. Steer clear and avoid the temptation to sin. Again, God has given his people so many privileges to his power, yet so many people wasted that power. So many Israelites wasted or rejected that power and turned to so much lesser things. And of course, God was displeased with them. God brought his vengeance and and justice upon them. Even Moses himself, with all that God did for him alone, he forsakes the Lord. He rebels against the Lord. You could read about that in Numbers chapter 20. God does these amazing things for Moses. God does these amazing things for his people, yet only two of them, only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, only two of them out of the 600,000 men, plus all the women and children, plus all of those other people that we talked about last week that accompanied the Israelites in leaving Egypt and, 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 and enjoying the Exodus, only two of them finished the job. Only two of them finished the journey. Only two of them finished their race. Only Joshua and Caleb actually remained faithful to God and finished their race well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 comes immediately following the famous invitation of Paul to run the race set before us as if we expect to to receive a prize. To run the race, to run the race of life with perseverance, to run it with forbearance. That is what God is calling us to do through calling us to obey, to use these warnings of those that have gone before for us, to follow these warnings of Israel and all those who have gone before us and to steer clear of the downward spiral that is sin. And Paul in verse number six reminds us that this, that keeping ourselves from the downward spiral of sin, it starts with what we have set our hearts on. It starts with where our hearts are focused on either sinning or surrendering to God. That hinges on whether or not we have our hearts set on evil, whether we have our hearts set on sin and the things of this world, or simply we have our hearts set on on God. Paul mentions first, don't become idolaters as some of the Israelites were. He says, don't sit down to eat and drink what God has set before us, only to then to get up and indulge in, in evil and revelry. Paul here is directly quoting verse number 6 of Exodus chapter 32, when there the Israelites sat down to eat the food that God had provided for them, only to then to get up, reject God, and indulge in evil and revelry. Paul says to us, finally, don't do that. Because don't be like them. Paul points out how prideful and arrogant one must be to sit down and indulge in all the good provision of God, of the good provision of our good God, to only then get up and reject him, to only then get up and and disobey his good commands, to only then get up and disobey the good provision that God has given to us. Here, referencing Numbers chapter 25, when Israel was enticed away from the Lord and into both idol worship and into sexual immorality by the Moabite women, Paul says to us, don't be like them. Don't give in to sexual sin. Rather, he says, flee from it. Sex here is another example of a good gift, of a good provision by our our good God that he gave to the Israelites that he still gives to us. Right again, sex is a good gift. God has given it to us freely. He's not withholding it from us. Yet so many times and in so many ways in our lives, we don't use that good gift in the way that our good God has has given it to us, in the way that our good God says that it is best for us, in the way that, that this good gift that is sex should be used, the way that it is best for our lives. Paul says to us, we should not put Christ to the test. He says that we should not grumble against God. What do we learn here? We hear Paul, when he speaks of putting Christ to the test, he he references Exodus chapter 17. But there the Israelites are grumbling against God. They're grumbling against Moses because they have no water. The Lord provides the Israelites with water from the rock. But before he does that, Moses says to the Israelites, he asks them a question. He says, why do you put God to the test? Why are you grumbling against me and against God? And I would say our world, and I'm going to speak for myself and and maybe for you as well, oftentimes is full of grumbling. 
I know I have, I have a tendency to grumble. We can all grumble about our job. We can grumble about our family, about our wives, about our children, about our position in life, about our lack of stuff. Is that the same for you at times, or is, is it just me? And when we grumble, when we pick, and when we complain about our lives, who do we ultimately grumble and complain against? Ultimately, we're grumbling and we're complaining against God, right? One of the things that we see throughout this study, again, is God provides. God gives good things. God longs to give good things. God gives grace and good gifts to those who seek his good gifts. Exodus chapter 17, the people grumble against Moses and God. And so God says to Moses this. He says, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will, water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Moribah. Because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? What I want to invite you to do this evening is the next time you find yourself grumbling, the next time you find yourself complaining against God or anyone or anything else, I want, you, I want to invite you to, to take a pause, pause your grumbling for a second, and ask yourself this question. Is the Lord with me or not? Is the, Lord, is the Lord working among me or not? And when I, I do this, I, and what I pray is that God, when you use this opportunity, when you open this opportunity up to God amidst your grumbling, that God uses that opportunity to show you all the ways that he has already proven to you that he is, in fact, with you, that he is, in fact, working among you, that he is, in fact, dwelling in your life. Finally, this is, and this is the invitation that is really the, the invitation of the entire passage and message today. Paul leaves us in verses 11 through 14. How did I get so far ahead? He leaves us with the invitation in verses 11 through 14 to heed these warning signs, to heed these examples of the people of Israel and flee from temptation. Do so knowing that God is faithful. Paul writes this, he says these things, all that we've talked about tonight and so many other examples of the Israelites' sin, he said these things happened, at, to, happened to us, to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on us whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it, so that you can endure the temptation. Simply, Paul's invitation to us men is, is to stand firm. It's to stand firm and make sure that you don't fall by falling into temptation. Because remember, even in temptation, in every temptation, no matter how great or how many those temptations may be, God promises to grant us a way out. God promises to grant us a way that we can flee from it. God promises to grant us a way that we can endure it and not fall in to temptation. Remember, again, being tempted to sin, no matter what the sin is, temptation itself is not a sin. Of course, we know Jesus himself was tempted, yet the difference between us and Jesus is Jesus never gave in to the temptation. Jesus never fell to temptation. Jesus never sinned. And so I want to close both our study this week and our spring session of men's ministry with what I hope are five very practical ways that we can overcome temptation. Five practical ways that we can turn from temptation, flee from temptation, and not fall to temptation. And in good preacher fashion, they all happen to start with the letter F. The first is to fight. To flee from temptation, we have to, to fight. To flee from temptation, to flee temptation, we have to stand firm and actually try to fight the temptation. We have to have an actual desire to flee and not fall to the temptation. And one of the ways that we do that is we have to develop a system. We have to be intentional about recognizing the warning signs that we're about to fall 
to temptation in our lives. We have to then be ready to, to fight those warning signs, to heed those warning signs. Of course, a, another example of worldly uh, warning signs is, is our car's check engine light, right? I think all of us probably know that when that check engine light starts flashing, you better pull over and figure out what is going on. You better pull over and find a, a remedy for whatever is going on when that light is flashing. And we have to fight. We have to fight our temptations. And one of the ways that we fight is by knowing when we are weak, by realizing when our own check engine light is, is flashing and when we are about to, to fall to temptation. Whether the warning signs in your life, what, whatever the warning signs are in your life and whatever the temptation is in your life, you have to fight. And one of the ways you fight is by taking the personal responsibility upon yourselves and knowing how it is and when it is you're most prone to fall. When it is and how it is you're most prone to fall to temptation. Paul says to us, men, stand and fight. He says to us, like a soldier in battle, know the opponent that you are up against. Know his battle tendencies. And the second way that we flee from temptation is to follow. It's to follow the example of Jesus. Listen, I just mentioned it. God's word promises, God himself promises that we are not alone in our temptations. We do not have a great high priest who is unable or unwilling to sympathize with our weaknesses who is unable or unwilling to sympathize with our temptation. Again, he was tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. So the invitation of God, the invitation of Jesus and his word is to follow his example, to study him, to really and deeply get to know him, to observe the way that he responded to his own temptations, the temptations of the world, and then put those practices into play in your own life. An example of this in, in my own life for me as a young pastor is, is being able to work here at GCC. I have an awesome example in a pastor, in Pastor Mike. And so I would be honestly a, a complete idiot if, if I would not follow his example, right? If I would not study him and, and observe what it is that he does and what it is that makes him such a, a wonderful pastor. And the same is true of our lives and the same is true of our walks with the Lord. Follow the example that has been paved, the perfect example that has been revealed to us in our Savior. And then thirdly, flee from temptation. Do not allow temptation a place, a space in your life. If that means cutting out friends, if that means cutting out co-workers, if that means cutting out places and situations, if that means putting blockers on your phone, whatever fleeing and eliminating temptation in your life looks like, do it. That's what it means to flee it. Flee temptation. Get away from it. Cut it off. Stop it. Cut it off at its roots. Get away from it and get as far away from it as you possibly can. Flee temptation. Run in the opposite direction. And then also fellowship. I really wish Todd was here for this one because he would love this one. Todd loves to, the, to say we're not meant to do life or our own life. Life alone, right? He's something that he says almost weekly here at Men's Ministry. It's something that's on our Men's Ministry page. It is a core value of our Men's Ministry here at GCC. We are not, as men or as women, we are not designed to do life alone. That is not how we were designed to live. Many will say, I can be a Christian without the church. I can be a Christian without the fellowship of believers that is the church. And I would say, yeah, you're right, but you shouldn't, right? You can be a Christian without the church, but, but you shouldn't try to be a Christian without the church. We are not meant to live alone. God himself is a three-in-one God. He is in relationship with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The same God and his three persons are one in the most intimate of senses. And as those, as we all are, who are created in this God's image, we are designed for intimate relationships. First, intimate relationships with that three-in-one God, with our Heavenly Father. But then also, we are designed for intimate relationships with one another. We are designed for intimate relationships with all other image bearers of God. I love the way Pastor David Jeremiah puts it in the importance of of not allowing ourselves to be isolated. He says, isolation is the ideal environment for temptation. 
But the community of believers, it is a safe harbor. We are designed to live together. We are designed to live in community. We are designed to be a part of a body bigger than ourselves. One of the greatest ways we flee from temptation is not facing temptation alone and on our own. Finally, I invite you to feed. To feed yourself with this word. To fill yourself with good food. Listen, we have... At max, only 16 weeks a year of men's ministry plus special events like our men's retreat, like our men's breakfast. And so even if you attend all of the events of men's ministry and even if you sit through all 52 worship gatherings on Sunday, you still will not have fed yourself a sufficient amount of this word, right? You still will not indulge in this word to a point where you have completely written it upon your heart. You have to feed this word to yourself, right? You have, it has to be like what God called the Israelites to do, right? He caused them to write this word upon their hearts, to put it upon the door frames of their homes, to hang it around their, their necks. We have to daily and deeply be in God's word ourselves. You have to feed yourself, drink from the fire hydrant of God's word, drink from the fire hydrant of God's grace that this word is. And as men, as men called to the distinct role of leadership that God has called men to, we do this to set an example. We do this not only for our good, but we do this for the good of all those around us. We do this for the good of our wives. We do this for the good of our marriages. We do this for the good of our family life, for our children. We do this for the good of all those that we have the opportunity to be a witness to. We do this for the good of our churches and the good of Grace Community Church. And so I want to close again this session and this evening with a few statistics. Statistics show, and there's many variations of this statistic, but they all show the same thing. Statistics show that 93% of the time, if the man of the house follows the Lord, 93% of the time, the family will follow. 93% of the time, if the man of the house follows the Lord, the house, the household, the family will follow. Compare that with if the women, the woman, the wife, is the first to follow the Lord, only 17% of the time will the family follow. 93% of the time, if the man follows, the entire family will follow. 17% if the wife comes to the Lord first, the family will follow then we have a great privilege, but also a massive responsibility before us. We have the influence to spark our family's eternal salvation or to lead them to their eternal damnation. We have the opportunity to help them grow into a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ or the opposite. The seeds of revival that we long for, the seeds of healthy families that we long for, begin with us. Begin with us setting the example for our families and for revival in our churches. Whether we want it or not, whether we know it or not, we are leaders in our worlds. We are leaders in our workplaces. We are leaders in our families. And we are leaders in this church. The question that we answer is what we are leading towards. The question that we answer is whether or not we are leading to or whether or not we are leading away from Christ. We answer that by the influence of our lives and our world. What we give our lives and influence to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, you are a good and awesome God. You've done amazing things for us, Lord, things that are indescribable. You are truly the God of immeasurably more than all that we could ever even begin to imagine, much less ask Lord, you have given us a good gift in your son, Jesus Christ, the gift that calls us out of this world, the gift that you sent your son into this world, not to condemn the world as it deserved, not to condemn us as we deserve, but to save us as we could not and would never deserve, Lord. But the reality is you have given us that gift, and through our profession that your son is Lord and believing in our hearts that you raised him from the dead, we can be saved from our sins we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that our sins are forgiven and that we will spend our eternity with Jesus and an eternity with Jesus is heaven. 
But Lord, we, while we thank you for that wonderful gift, Lord, we also ask that you would empower us through the power of your Holy Spirit, by the authority of your word, to live out the privilege and purpose that comes with that gift. The privilege in person, especially as men gathered here tonight, the privilege and purpose of being leaders, leading our families, leading our churches, leading our loved ones, co-workers and friends, either towards Christ or away from Christ, Lord. And so I pray very purposely for each man that is hearing my voice tonight that we would grow first in our personal relationship with you, that we would grow in your grace and in your knowledge, that we would commit to putting hand the plow in fleeing temptation and living our lives, serving and glorifying you. And then as we do that, Lord, I pray that you would empower us to do so, but that you would also use our lives as bright lights shining to all those that are around us, Lord that you would use that commitment of our lives to heal our marriages, to heal our lives, to heal our relationships with those that are around us and to make us more, perfectly, uh, more perfect image bearers of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We ask that you would remove the, the hindrance, the blemish of sin from our lives, Lord, so that we can live more perfectly and more radiantly in the light of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray again that you would do a work in us through this men's retreat that is ahead of us, through the men's Good Friday breakfast, Lord, and that throughout this summer as we go between the times of our spring and fall session, Lord, I pray that the fervor that you have raised up in these men's hearts and minds, Lord, that it would not wane, that it would be protected and sealed by the Holy Spirit, and that it would be clear through all that we encounter. Until we gather again, Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would make us more holy and more perfectly, more like you more like your son, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, at this time, uh, you're dismissed for your small groups. For the last